Hey all y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carrie. This is where I talk about knitting, my tips, my tricks, my opinions, and my preferences. I love knitting in the round. Hats, socks, stuffed animals, towels. I just really enjoy that process of knitting projects in the round. But I have a confession. I used to be really bad at getting the right sizes and I didn't know why. Like I would knit a hat and I would I would be a good little knitter and I would knit my swatch and be like great I hit gauge I go to work with my hat and then it would be too big. I was knitting for years well yes years before I found out that I was knitting my swatches or in the round projects all wrong. I was working a swatch flat but doing the project in the round and it turns out in most instances that will give you an inaccurate gauge. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how you can knit swatches in the round and have your hats or your socks or your sleeves or whatever it is work every time. If you want to find out all about it, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give this video a thumbs up and let's knit. In the description box is a list of materials featured in this video with affiliate links. If you click on an affiliate link and make a purchase, I will receive a small commission which helps support my channel. My channel exists to spread the joy of knitting and crafting and I will not recommend anything that does not fulfill that mission. Thank you for your support. So why, if working your projects in the round, do you need to knit your swatches in the round? Well, when you knit stockinette flat, you alternate one row of knit stitches with one row of purl stitches so that when you look at the front of the work, all you see are those Vs that the legs form. That's the nature of stockinette. In the round, when you knit stockinette, you knit every row, and that has to do with the fact that when you knit in the round, the front of the work is always facing you. Now, most knitters, their knits and their purls are not exactly the same size. And the difference between your sizes of your knit stitches and the sizes of your purl stitches mean that you can end up with a different gauge when you knit stockinette flat versus in the round. And it's not just stockinette stitch. Garter, when you knit garter flat, you knit every single row. But when you work a garter pattern in the round, you alternate knits and purls. So any fabric that is based on garter stitch or is based on stockinette, you are absolutely going to need to make a swatch that is in the round. Okay, great. Great, great. Got it? Got it. Knit my swatches in the round if I'm working in the round, great. Why is this video still going on? There are some challenges to knitting swatches in the round. And the big one is how do you get a big enough swatch? Because here's the thing about swatches, gauge swatches, is they really are a survey of your stitches to figure out what your average stitch size is. In hand knitting, we are not machines. Not every single knit stitch that we make or purl stitch that we make is going to be the exact same size. And so what the gauge swatch is all about is figuring out what is your average tension? What is your average stitch size, right? Well, the thing about averages is the larger the sample that you take, the more accurate the average is. So if you knit too small of a swatch, you may not be getting an accurate average of your tension. Now, a flat swatch, I usually aim to make a swatch that's about five to six inches by five to six inches. And the reason I try to knit that large of a swatch is that it gives me plenty of space to measure my stitches, you know, well away from either the cast on and bind off edges and from the two vertical edges of the swatch. So I'm getting right in the middle of my swatch and it's all nice and flat and I have plenty of stitches. I have a good solid four inches right in the middle of the swatch that I can measure. So if I just knit a tube that is five to six inches in circumference, well 
Measuring that becomes kind of a pain in the tuchus. For one thing, I could try to just measure part of the stitches halfway across, but then I'm not being able to measure, like get a good four inches to count off to check my gauge. And I'm not actually getting an effective size there, an effective survey of my stitches there. But there is another way that uses less yarn, and you can actually knit an in-the-round swatch flat. What? If you're seeing there going, uh, Carrie, I don't see how you could possibly knit a swatch in the round flat. I respect your skepticism. Okay, so um, here I have my swatch, and the first row, I'm just going to knit across thusly. Knitting, I'm knitting across. All right, so I'm coming here to the end. What I would do next normally is to turn my needle so I could knit back across the row. What I'm going to do instead for my simulated swatch in the round is I'm going to take my needle and I'm going to slide the work back to the other side of the needle. Okay? So this way I can start knitting from right to left again as if I were knitting in the round. However, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Carrie, your yarn is way over here. What are you going to do about that? It's very simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my yarn and I'm going to create a giant float across the back. And I'm going to leave this really loose because I don't want it to create uneven tension. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay? I'm going to just let that flop. Next I'm going to knit. This first stitch, however, I'm actually going to go ahead and twist the stitch, which I will explain at the end of this round row, whatever you want to call it. And now I can knit again across the row. Alright, so I'm getting here to the end, and what I'm going to do when I get here to the end, I again I'm going to work through the back and I'm going to twist the stitch, and that's going to help keep this edge stitch nice and tidy. One thing about doing this technique is these edge stitches, especially on the left side of the swatch, tend to get very loose and sloppy. It's fine. Um, you can control a lot of that by twisting the stitch here. Now I'm going to just slide my needle back across, create another float, and normally to create the float you need this to be a loose enough float because you don't want the float to be distorting the fabric anyway. So normally what I do is I kind of just pull it straight across and then I pull out a little extra length so that it's about one and a half times the length of the swatch itself. You can even double it if you want. Um, sometimes I will hook the float around my left hand as if I'm going to knit continental just to sort of have it controlled and out of my way as I knit with my right hand. Obviously if you're knitting continental you would do the opposite. I find on the right side the stitches don't get as sloppy as they do on the left side but I go ahead and twist that stitch as well just for consistency but also just to be sure that it's secure. You can see right here, see how that stitch gets loose? Twisting it helps control it, but those stitches on the right, see how loose they are? And that's just kind of the nature of it. Something else you can do is you can pull the float itself that's underneath. If you pull the floats, that'll help tidy it up. And that just kind of keeps these stitches tidy here on the edge. Every once in a while, I, I will go through and kind of pull those floats just to tidy up the stitches on the side. Um, it makes me feel better. That's the main reason why. It just makes me feel better. <laughs> All right, so this next float I'm going to do, but I'm going to go ahead and work it continental just so you can see what that looks like. Because here's the thing. When you do this continental, the temptation is going to be to knit the float, but you want to make sure that you're working off the working yarn. So I want to make sure that I tension the working yarn and then kind of have that float down below. Once you've got that first stitch, though, done and you're all set up, it's not a big deal. The float just hangs out behind the work and is out of the way. It's just when you're making that transition to your next quote-unquote round. So this is what it starts to look like. And you can see on the back, you've got these really long floats, these loose, loose floats. And over here, you just have your stockinette stitch. And this represents 
half, basically, of a swatch worked in the round. So I'm going to keep knitting this swatch up. Um, now you might be going, wow, it just seems like those floats is wasting a lot of yarn. And it is a lot of yarn. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot of yarn that ends up as a big giant float behind the work. But it's still less yarn than what you would utilize if you were to knit a proper tube in the round tube as your gauge swatch. This is still going to be less yarn. I'm not going to finish this whole swatch today on camera, but I want to just discuss really quickly what to do when you are finished with a swatch like this and the basics of how to measure this. After completing my rounds, I personally will work one purl row at the top and then I will go off and bind off. Then I would wash and block this. There are two options with how you want to deal with these floats when you are finished with your swatch. One thing that you can do is you can just take scissors and cut them and then you can take the ends right and tie them together and that will help keep these edges stabilized. The upside of doing that uh, when you wash and block, it's very easy because these floats are out of your way and you can wash and block your swatch according to however you plan to handle that for your project. The downside of cutting those floats and tying them off that way is if, let's say you're working on your project and you're lo you lose at yarn chicken, you can't come to your swatch for a little extra yarn. That swatch is done. You have no reserve within your swatch. Maybe that matters to you, maybe that doesn't matter to you. The other option, which is the one that I tend to go with because I like, I feel better just knowing that if I ever needed to, I could unravel my swatch and use that yarn if I needed to. That's me. Um, it's just to leave the floats as they are. What I do when I go to wash and block is I just put the swatch upside down. Now, generally, if I'm working something in the round, I'm not going to be doing a pin block anyway, so I don't worry about pin blocking my swatch because I block my swatch the way that I plan to block my project. It's just a general rule of thumb. If I was working a project, say, in lace, where maybe I would need to provide some stretch, some tension to that in order to open the lace up, then I might do a little bit of a light pin blocking with my swatch. But again, I would just put the work upside down like this because if I try to pin block with these floats, well, that's not gonna work. But I can always turn the work upside down and pin it from this side instead. If I was worried that doing that upside down wouldn't give me an accurate tension or gauge, in that instance, I might go ahead and cut the floats and tie off the ends and then I could block the work right side up. Those are kind of your two options in terms to how to handle the floats after you're done with your swatch. In terms of measuring a swatch like this, um, do I have it down here? I should. I don't have my usual ruler with me right now, but I have this. This is a little, this is another quilter's ruler, and actually I kind of like this for swatches. This is not a necessity, but it is something I like to have because this is a perfect 4x4 four four square. And so I know if my swatch is bigger than this square that I have a good size swatch. I have a blog post that talks about how to knit and measure an effective gauge swatch, which I will link down in the description box if you want to read kind of all my rules for gauge swatches. But one of them is that when you measure your gauge swatch, no matter how you do it, is that you need to be able to measure well away from either your side stitches or your cast on and bind off rows. And that's because the stitches, the first two or three stitches, even on a regular swatch that's knitted flat, can either be a little looser or a little tighter than your average stitches in the middle. Your stitches in the middle are your most sort of average stitches and measuring their stitches in the middle will give you your best um, gauge of what your tension is. When you do a simulated swatch in the round like this, 
you need to measure even farther into the middle than you normally would because obviously you don't want to count these first and last stitches on each round. They're twisted, they get all funky because of the floats coming off of them. Like you definitely don't want to include these stitches in any measurement that you do because that is not representative in any way of your tension, right? But also even, and it might not be perceptible to your eye, but even these stitches, like this, the, the second or third stitch away from the edge, most likely will not be indicative of what your average stitch tension is. So I try to measure at least four stitches in from either edge. So one thing about knitting a gauge swatch like this, a simulated in the round gauge swatch, is I will actually cast on even more stitches than I would normally if I were knitting flat. Uh, about basically like six to eight more stitches than I would if I were doing a flat swatch. That's kind of my rule of thumb. And remember how I said that when I finish this, I do one row of purl stitches and then I bind off? Well, also when I started this swatch, I did a row of purl stitches first. You want to make sure with a swatch like this that if you did any rows with purls, that you do not include those rows in your swatch measurement because that will throw off your average. So you want to measure well away from the um, cast on and the bind off edge. I've seen people online who've used simulated swatches in the round like this and have complained that they haven't gotten an accurate gauge swatch from it. I think my suspicion is that they are not measuring well within the middle of the work. But all you need to do is to do a large enough swatch so that you can measure well within the middle of your swatch so that you have a good solid average. If you do those things, you can have a very successful simulated swatch in the round. So there it is. That is how I generally will swatch in the round. I have found this to be highly effective. And for those instances when I am doing a project like a hat, or socks where I want to make sure that I have the right gauge, but I don't want to knit a whole project <laughs> to do a gauge swatch. I have found that working a simulated swatch in the round has been highly, highly effective. And my hat knitting became so much more successful once I started employing this technique. What about you? What tips or tricks do you have for knitting in the round, having an accurate gauge swatch, is this something that you have done? Has it been successful? Is this something you will try out in the future? Or are you someone who says, fudge it, I don't swatch it all. I just take it, I just cast on and what happens, happens. These are all valid choices. I am not judging. No, I'm not judging, I promise. So thank you for joining me today. I hope that you got some useful information. I hope also that you will give this video a thumbs up and share it with your knitting friends. Liking my videos, sharing them with friends, commenting down below, hitting subscribe, and the notification bell. These are all ways that you can help support my channel and let YouTube know that this is a space worth checking out. If, if you're planning to do a little shopping anyway, and you would like to support my channel, please consider utilizing one of my affiliate links. Affiliate links if you make a purchase after utilizing them, I might receive a small commission and this helps support my channel. If you'd like to find me on social media, I am very active on Twitter and Instagram. On my social media is, you got it, down in the description box below. I hope that you have a wonderful day, evening, weeknight, weekend, whenever you may be watching this. And as always, happy health and happy knitting. Bye. Ooh, 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 ooh. Energy high, feeling good about shooting today. So today I'm going to show you. So today I'm going to tell you. Bleh. So today, <laughs> I gotta get this. Sorry, I'm a little, I'm a little burpy this morning. <laughs> I'm a little burpy, and my chest hurts. It's I pulled something. I pulled something in my sternum. 
like I don't know if it was a tendon or if there's a muscle right there but I pulled something oh by the way before I forget also at the end of the video if you're like I don't want to leave you I'm having so much fun there will be video suggestions if you want to watch another video please you can click on one of them also you'll have one last chance to subscribe to my channel before this video ends all right there's a little picture it's down in the description there's a little picture off to the corner is it this corner this corner I can't remember which corner it is but there is a picture if you click on the picture you can also subscribe to my channels anyway I'm done <laughs> I'm done plugging plugs gotta get in the shameless plugs hashtag shameless plugs I need a song for my shameless plugs ooh, 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 ooh. this dance move doesn't hurt ooh, ooh. Do the robot. Done. Bye. Thank you for joining me. Bye. <laughs> oh.